Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to make a start, at the very least, on my review of 48 by James Herbert. Not too sure this is a good idea, because I've had some... James Herbert is one of those authors where my reviews of him tend to attract the most negative comments, and I don't know why. There must just be a lot of James Herbert fanboys out there. Um, but yeah, I'm going to share at least my thoughts of the book. Um, I'm going to start by reading the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will say, as you can see, this is part of a bind-up where it was. It came with uh, The Ghosts of Sleeth, which is one of the David Ash books. It's either book number two or three, I'm not sure which one. Um, but I haven't read the first David Ash book, so it's very weird basically having a bind-up of two books, one series, one standalone, and the series one is in the middle of the series, so it's not as though, at, le at least if it had been the start book, I could have read it, you know, but I, I am going to get to that sooner rather than later anyway. I've actually got Haunted, which is the first book on its way to me. So the blurb, 48. Dane reads... In 1945, Hitler unleashes the blood death on Britain as his final act of vengeance. Hoke, an American pilot and one of a tiny minority with a blood group unaffected by the killer disease, has survived among the debris and the dead of London for three years. Now, in 48, he is running for his life, hunted through the ruined city's ravaged streets by a desperate group of slow-dying fascist black shirts. They're after his blood. And they really are. They basically want to get like a blood transfusion from him to stop them from dying. Right at the start, my main, I guess, complaint about this book was that it starts with an action scene and you don't know anything about the characters or the setting or anything. So it was very hard to get into during that first chapter because it's like, well, I'd, I don't care if this man lives or dies. I don't know who he is, you know? It's like he's been chased by some people. They're trying to kill him. He could be a bad guy for all I know. I have no idea. So it was a bit of a strange start to just go straight into the action without any explanation, I suppose. Or any of the world building as well. So, you, you know, I knew what was going on because of the blurb, not because of what the book itself told me, which seems like a really strange way to do it. I don't know if it's d deliberate. It's almost as though the... Well, for, for like the first couple of chapters, it's almost as though the blurb is spoiler filled. Except, I don't think I know anybody who just picks up a book and doesn't read the blurb. So, I guess you're supposed to know it. I don't know, it was, a, it was a very strange start. And here, right at the end of that first chapter, so we're on page 20 by this point. After all of this chase scene and whatnot. And this is the first real kind of inkling we get of what's actually going on. Through the gates I sped and around the old Queen's Memorial, past the statues of women and children I'd gazed at from the balcony room less than ten minutes ago, round to the other side where Victoria herself sat facing the long elm and lime-lined mouth. I swear I could feel her mournful eyes on my back as I fled Buckingham Palace, heading for another sanctuary in the dead city. Half a century ago she'd been proud mother to a fabulous empire in a great country. Now there was nothing left of empire and precious little of country. Better than those eyes were only of stone. I do like that uh, eyes only of stone lime. Uh, we get an uh, an end bomb as well, because um, this guy's American, so he's talking about some of the racism back home, basically in the in the in the deep south. Really sure how I feel about that. So we're just going to move on. And so again, he's still running away from these guys, and um, we get this this little bit here. I waited until the black shirts had discharged another volley before setting off again, firing back at them just as wildly, but maybe a bit more effectively. They kept out of sight, aware that any kind of wound could prove serious without the right medical attention, and medical attention was just what the whole fucking world lacked. So I do like that as well, that kind of highlight on the lack of medical attention. Funnily enough, at the time of uh, filming this, I've got a toothache, uh, but that reminds me there's a scene in my novel, Meat, which is very like post-apocalyptic where someone has, uh, I, think, I think, what is it called, necrotizing fasciitis, I think it's called. It's when your um, your tooth basically begins to die, um, and it's horrible. It's like one of the worst pains ever. Um, I mean, I've not given birth, so I can't compare it to that. But it is like widely held to be one of the most painful things ever. Um, and I've had that a couple of times, and I had to have emergency medical treatment where they, emergency dental treatment where they pull your tooth out. Um, like there's one time I had that at like 1 a.m. and it's literally you just you couldn't even I mean I couldn't even lie still. The only way to what it what happens is this is totally going off on a tangent by the way. But what happens is um, as soon as you get some like cold air in your mouth or cold water or anything like that, uh, it causes the nerve to contract. 
and then when the cold goes again it expands but in the meantime basically little bits of crap have like fallen into the gap and so suddenly your nerve is expanding into a space that's too small for it and the only real way to deal with it is to keep pouring cold water into your mouth and it just keeps that nerve um, contracted so that's like the only temporary fix so when it's happened to me I've been up from 1 a.m. till I could get emergency dental treatment the next day just putting cold water in my mouth hoping you know that the pain won't come back and so uh, a little bit later on page 36 we learn um, that it's the AB blood uh, AB negative specifically blood type is the only one that isn't affected by the blood death kind of got me wondering and I'm sure this has been tested but I got me wondering whether certain blood types are more or less susceptible to COVID and just a little line here which I did enjoy um, it says funny thing when you're living on borrowed time as those goons outside were life becomes even more precious and it's very true like we take life for granted until we get like a terminal diagnosis or something like that and then that's when we're like shit better you know better make every second count it's like we should be doing that every day so this bit was kind of interesting because we get to see the fate of some people who were on a train when the blood death struck um and i found it interesting the reference to the dead man's handle which i've heard of before but it's one of those things i'd forgotten that i knew um the idea being that if a train driver dies while driving the train then the train will stop driving basically so he says nothing would nothing should have shocked me by now Three years of living among sights that were the stuff of nightmares should have conditioned me. But the skull head that returned my stare, with its black hollow eyes and gaping grin, made me jump back in fright. Stupidly, I'd expected the train to be empty. Of course passengers had been travelling on the underground network all over the city when the disease had struck, the blood death drifting down into the tunnels, seeking out its victims like some predator roaming the burrows of the earth, and the dead man's handle had jammed on as soon as the train driver had slumped over, cutting the circuit so that the carriages had come to a halt, to remain locked there in the darkness as one by one their occupants keeled over. How many had escaped? I wondered. How many of the AB Negs, if there'd been any on board, had managed to crawl out into the tunnels and make their way back to the surface, only to wish they'd died with their fellow travellers below? Oh, horrible. And then they see a little reference to um, Hitler, so he goes, On the wall outside one of the open doorways was a yellowing poster, an upper corner drooping over, and as I passed by I saw there were two pictures of Adolf Hitler on it, front and profile, wanted writ large at the top, smaller headline type explaining why. For murder, it said, for kidnapping, for theft and arson. It should have added, for world genocide. There's a great line, um, Sissy, um, he almost dies, and uh, Sissy goes, Yank, you've got enough lives to keep a dozen cats happy. Which would be what? 84 lives. No, they have nine, don't they? 118 lives. And the German says to him, women are now the world's most precious commodity, my friend. And uh, Sissy goes, oh, sure we are. Who else is going to give birth to more chumps like you two so they can grow up and start a whole new war just to finish off what's left of the human race? He talks about some of the animals who so he's seen like horses roaming the roads, which is crazy, like the idea of just essentially a wild horse pottering about London. But that just goes to show how much the world has changed after the blood death. And he rescued this dog and, and he says, eventually I called the dog Cagney because of the red hair. Amazing what a scrub down had produced and a certain wise guy attitude. And it became he because now the mutt had a personality, which I think is how a lot of people think about animals. I always think of them as he or she. I'm sure, are there non-binary animals? Yeah, there must be. There's, um, there's animals that don't have genders, right? And um, they're worried about some wild dogs, and so um, the protagonist, he shoots them, and he goes, uh, I'd taken out that first and meanest looking one with two bullets to its head, the gunshot reverberating like thunder around the confines of the tunnel. Taking my old instructor's sound advice, I'd followed the first shot with a rapid second just to make sure. You don't need to do that with a rifle, but a handgun is less powerful, so you could never be sure if the first bullet had inflicted enough damage. And we get some great stuff about like class differences here. So, um... I think it's Muriel, Muriel. It's either Muriel or Sissy. I think it's Muriel who says, oh yes, what a wonderful example you toffs set for us common folk. My oh my, if you lot could survive on spam and powdered eggs quaffed down with only the scummiest vintage wine, then the rest of us peasants could easily get by on good old Lord Walton's bloody pie. God bless you, ma'am. If I had a cap, I'd doff it. And um, they all, they decide to have a drink because what else are you gonna do when the world's over, right? And so Sissy goes, give me something strong, long and life preserving, something I can regret tomorrow. And they have gin but no tonic, but they have a tin of peaches and use the juice, which actually sounds quite nice. Is that what uh, Snoop Dogg was on about in Gin and Juice? Laid back with my mind on my money and my money on my mind. 
And uh, a little bit of backstory here, which again, I just thought was interesting. This kind of helps to set the scene and what was going on in the rest of the world, but also fleshes out the characters, you know? Muriel's mother, Lady Daphne Drake, had been struck down in the first year of the war, but not by anything the Mad Fiora had sent over. A number 14 bus had knocked down Lady Daphne as she'd tried to cross Piccadilly Circus during the blackout, after she'd enjoyed Jack Hulbert singing for the Conger and outwitting Nazi spies in Under Your Hat, the bus killing her instantly and leaving Muriel pretty much alone with her father, Lord Montague Drake. Muriel's two older brothers, who had joined the forces as soon as war was declared and much against her father's wishes, were in other parts fighting the Germans, one with the Navy, the other with an RAF squadron based on Malta. Muriel had not heard from either of her brothers since the blood death outbreak and, not knowing if they shared the same blood type as her, assumed they were both dead. And we get a great your mum joke. Um, I, sent, I sent this to my friend Joe because we quite often do your mum jokes to each other. Your ma's got no sense of direction, he'd always joke with me. Lose herself in the parlour if she didn't have me around to call her. We get a reference to the uh, authorities' grand idea of turning gas masks into Mickey Mouse faces so the kids wouldn't be afraid to wear them. Which I believe is true, I don't know if they ever actually did it. I have a feeling they did because I'm sure I've seen some photos, but there might have been fake photos. And we get, he, goes, uh, he goes for a drive, he has to drive somewhere. And we get this little passage, which again I just think helps to build what the state of the world is like. Um, I kept alert, constantly on the lookout for the unexpected. One time, about a year and some months ago, a crazy had jumped out of the truck I was using, an Austin 5 ton, as I recall. It's flapped sides and back easy for loading. He was waving a butcher's meat axe over his head and hollering gibberish at me. Maybe I would have stopped, but it was the middle of winter and this guy was stark naked. And oh yeah, around his neck, under a long greasy beard, he wore a ragged necklace of severed blackened hands. When he realised I wasn't going to stop, he threw the axe at me. Luckily his aim was poor, and it broke through the windshield on the passenger side, so I kept going, heading straight for him, figuring he wasn't in the mood to discuss his complaint. Well, he didn't even try to dodge me, just kept coming forward, screaming and shaking his fists, and I didn't try to avoid him either. I ran right over him, and when I stopped further down the road and looked back, I saw his naked body was still twitching. And then Albert says, there's time for a pair of teeth first though, what can I get you? And then Muriel explains to him, he means an aperitif. Uh, and then we get this three foot high black animal that, because they're in the, I think, I can't remember what hotel now. It's actually been a, about a week or so since I read it. So I can't remember specifically the hotel name. Um, but they're in this hotel and they wheel out this three foot high black statue of an animal. And uh, Muriel introduced it uh, when they sat down to eat. Meet Casper, she'd said. He's our guest this evening because the Pinafore Room used to be used by members of what was known as The Other Club, a collection of, well, rather eminent people and politicians. Winston Churchill was one of them. The politicians dined here whenever Parliament was in session, industrialists and other powerful men joining them. You'll see there's seating for 14 around the table, but whenever there was an empty chair and the number of people present was an unlucky 13, they brought out Casper the cat. They tied a napkin around his neck and served him every course. Again, that just sort of little bit of superstition. It's like how um, some hotels don't have a, a floor 13. And then they have a little debate about whether black cats are bad luck or good luck, which as a black cat owner, I found quite amusing. There's also a reference to Grimm's fairy tales, um, which I'd just been reading Philip Pullman's uh, Grimm Tales book, just as I, uh, was, I was listening to the audio book of that at around the same time as reading this. So I thought that was quite interesting. And then right right at the end of it, we learn what happened to his fiancée and how he discovered her. Um, I was already traumatised by the time I found Sally lying outside on the steps leading down to our basement flat, and the sight of her nearly finished me. Her eyes were missing, her flesh torn open. The rats had eaten into her belly and ripped the fetus of our unborn child from her womb. They'd left it on the step, close to her outstretched hand, half eaten, almost unrecognisable. I'd known what it was though, and I'd given into the hysteria right there beside them both, my wife and our baby, given into the madness that had sustained me for at least a year afterwards. Maybe not all that madness had left me yet. And I think that's a nice little point to end on, because that demonstrates how there are a lot of like themes in this that relate to Herbert's other work. Uh, so rats are in this a few times, not the giant rats of the rats books, but still rats. Uh, we get a few references to the new forest, which he's done before. Um, I didn't particularly like the fact that it was told, told in first person, but then that's just me as a reader. I, I never really enjoy first person stories quite as much. Um, there also wasn't as much gore as there are in some of his other books. I mean, that final scene ex is the exception rather than the rule. Um, and I quite like James Herbert writing gore because he's really good at it. A little bit of sex here and there. There's a twist about halfway through, three quarters of the way through, um, which changes things and then like quite a... You know, cool scene at Tower Bridge at the end. Um, but overall, bear in mind how interested I was in the concept. I didn't quite enjoy it as much as I thought I was going to do. To be honest, I think after that 
like missed opportunity with the intro where it just really struggled to get me on board with the story I just wasn't as invested as I would have been if he'd have led us into it a little bit more um, but overall I still gave it a 3.5 out of 5 it was pretty good it's James Herbert he's always pretty good probably in the, like the lower half of his novels for me but it's it's not his worst and I still have a bunch left to read so so there is that um, yeah, 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of 48 by James Herbert. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.